Welcome to War Chronicle, where forgotten battles, untold strategies, and legendary warriors come back to life. The Indian Air Force has been looking for a light combat aircraft for a while now. The requirements were pretty ambitious, including being able to carry heavy weapons like air-to-surface missiles, having good multi-role capabilities, and even the ability to do aerial refueling, which is just unheard of in this class of aircraft. No. In 2022, they finally found it in the form of the Swedish Saab Gripen. But wait a second, did they? Because we all know that India went with the Tijus instead. So what gives? Was the Gripen really so much better than the Tijus? Or was there more to the story? Well, let's find out in today's episode of Forgotten Fighters. Now the story begins way back in 1990 when the Indian Air Force came up with the concept of the Light Combat Aircraft or LCA program. The plan was to build a single engine, single seat, multi-role supersonic jet aircraft with the primary mission of ground attack, but also with the capability to perform air superiority missions if needed. Plus, they wanted it to be cost-effective and easy to maintain. This sounds pretty straightforward, right? But they also wanted the aircraft to have a glass cockpit with modern avionics active electronically scanned array radar, the ability to supercruise at Mach 1.3 range of at least 1,500 kilometers, with the ability to carry 6,000 kgs of weapon and payload, and even the ability to do aerial refueling. To say that this was an ambitious project would be an understatement. Most light fighters at the time had a very limited set of capabilities. Take the famous Israeli K-4, for example, a twin-engine multi-role fighter with a very impressive resume. But if you look under the hood, you'll see that it was only designed to carry two small air-to-ground missiles, one on each wing pylon. Everything else had to be carried internally in the bomb bay. The thing is, for an aircraft to effectively perform ground attack missions, you need to be able to carry a lot of ordnance, and not just two little baby missiles. Not to mention that none of these aircraft could do aerial refueling, something that the Indians wanted as a key feature for their new LCA. So clearly they were aiming high, and they wanted an aircraft that could do everything from air defense to ground attack to reconnaissance to even maritime strike roles. They literally wanted an Allen one package, and they weren't afraid to dream big. Who could blame them? After all, the LCA project had been in development for over a decade already, by 1990, the Indian Air Force had managed to indigenously develop a lot of important systems for the aircraft. All they needed was a fighter that would serve as a platform for these systems. And that is where the Gripen came in. Saab had been trying to sell the Gripen to India since 1989, but the Indians weren't interested at first. They had their own aircraft in development, and they didn't need Saab's help. However, by 1997, things changed. The LCA program was running into development hell, and India realized that they would unt be able to produce a complete aircraft in time. So they decided to look outside, and the Gripen became the front runner. In fact, during the 1998 Pokhran nuclear tests, Indian Air Force officers were present at the nearby Swedish airbase watching the Gripen fly in and out. The fighter had made quite an impression on them, and they started to seriously consider it as the future of their air force. But the Gripen wasn't some miracle aircraft that suddenly appeared out of nowhere. It had its roots in the preceding Saab 37 Viggen, a multi-role fighter that first flew in 1971. By the early 1980s, it became clear that the Viggen was starting to show its age and that it would need to be replaced soon. So Saab began work on a new aircraft known as the Saab 39 Gripen, which means eagle in Swedish. The prototype first flew in 1988, and by 1993 it entered service. Unlike most fighters, the Gripen was designed from the start as a multi-role platform, which meant that it could carry both air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missiles, as well as bombs and other ordnance. It also had an integrated sensor platform called the RAMI, or the Real-Time Embedded Multifunction Information System, which basically combined the functions of multiple systems into one, thus reducing weight and increasing reliability. The RAMI consisted of three main components, the RMIS computer, the data link, and the triple redundant hot swappable computing unit. These systems allowed the Gripen to process data from various sensors in real time and make it available to the pilot through a single integrated display. This made the Gripen one of the most technologically advanced fighters of its time, and it caught the attention of many countries. One of those countries was India. By the late 1990s, India was looking for a replacement for its aging fleet of MiG-21s and the Gripen seemed like the perfect fit. 
It was modern, multi-role, cheap, and easy to maintain, and it could carry a lot of ordnance. Plus, it came with an offer from Saab to transfer technology and help India build the aircraft locally, which would not only save India money, but also boost its defense industry. That sounded great, and everyone was happy. Saab got a new customer, India got a new fighter, and the Indian Air Force got a modern replacement for the MiG-21, or so it seemed. You see, while the Gripen did seem like the best option on paper, there were some problems. The first was that India had already invested too much time and money into their own LCA project to abandon it now. They had developed many key systems for the aircraft, and they didn't want to waste all that effort. Second, the Gripen was designed and built for Sweden's specific needs, and it might not be the best fit for India's diverse and challenging terrain. Third, the Gripen was a single-engine aircraft, and India preferred twin-engine fighters for their main combat aircraft. Finally, there was the issue of cost. Even though the Gripen was cheaper than most Western fighters, it was still more expensive than the LCA, which was supposed to be a cheap and cost-effective solution. So what did India do? Well, they decided to go with the option no. Three, which was to use the Gripen as a stopgap measure while continuing to develop their own. LCA, they ordered 14 Gripen fighters from SOB in 2003, along with a license to manufacture them locally in India. This meant that India would get the benefits of the Gripen without having to buy all of them from Sweden. They would also get access to the latest upgrades and modifications that Saab made to the aircraft. But this also meant that Saab would have to work closely with India to adapt the Gripen to Indian standards and requirements. This included things like integrating Indian weapons and systems onto the Gripen, training Indian pilots and maintenance personnel on how to fly and maintain the aircraft, and providing technical assistance and support to India. For Saab, this was a golden opportunity to showcase the Gripen S capabilities and to gain a foothold in the Indian market. This could lead to more orders for the Gripen, as well as other Saab products such as radars, electronic warfare systems, and training simulators. Plus, this deal was part of a broader trend of Western countries selling advanced military technology to India, which reflected India's growing importance as a major player in the Asia-Pacific region. However, there was also a downside to this deal for Saab. By working closely with India, Saab would be sharing sensitive information about the Gripen with them, which could potentially allow India to reverse engineer the aircraft and build their own version of it. This could undermine Saab's efforts to sell the Gripen to other countries, and it could also hurt Saab's reputation as a provider of cutting-edge military technology. Nevertheless, Saab went ahead with the deal and delivered the first Gripen to India in 2013, this was followed by several more deliveries over the next few years, bringing the total number of Gripens in service with the Indian Air Force to around 36. Meanwhile, India's own LCA program was still ongoing, and it looked like it would take a while longer before the aircraft would be ready for production. So the Gripens were supposed to serve as a stopgap measure until then. But here's where the story takes a twist. Because as it turned out, the Gripens did not just fill the void, they actually impressed everyone. The Indian pilots and maintainers loved flying and maintaining the Gripen, and they praised its performance and reliability. They also found that the Gripen was very easy to integrate with Indian weapons and systems, especially the indigenous air-to-ground missile, the Brahmos. In fact, the Gripen became the first non-Russian aircraft to successfully fire a Brahmos missile in combat against terrorist targets in Jammu and Kashmir. This showed that the Gripen was not only accurate and effective, but also compatible with India's advanced weapon systems. On top of that, Saab kept working hard to improve the Gripen and to add new features and capabilities to it. One of those features was the ability to carry the Rafael Air 2 ground missile, which is one of the most advanced and deadly weapons in India's arsenal. The Rafael is a long-range precision-guided missile with a top-over attack capability, meaning that it flies above the target and detonates downward where the armor is thinnest. This makes it very effective against armored vehicles and bunkers, and it complements the Brahmos missile, which has a side over. Attack Capability Another feature that Saab added to the Gripen was the ability to carry the Astray air-to-air -air missile, which is a short-range infrared homing missile that can be fired beyond visual range. This gives the Gripen a significant boost in its air-to-air -air capabilities and makes it a more formidable fighter. As for the LCA, 
It eventually entered service in 2016 after more than two decades in development hell. But it did not live up to its billing. It was plagued with technical problems, and it was not as capable or as advanced as the Gripen. In fact, the LCA was not even accepted by the Indian Air Force until 2020, and it is still undergoing trials and testing. So what does this mean for Saab and the Gripen? Well, it means that they have won the bet. Saab's risk is paid off, and they have secured a place in Indian defense industry history by providing India with a modern and advanced fighter jet that has met and exceeded their expectations. However, it also means that their relationship with India has become more complicated. Saab has lost the advantage of keeping the gripe in a secret and has had to share it with India. This has not only limited their ability to sell the gripe into other countries, but has also opened up possibilities for India to independently manufacture and upgrade the Gripen, potentially creating competition for Saab themselves. Now, I do want to know what kind of agreement Saab has with the Indians regarding the transfer of technology and know-how. Maybe they have a watertight agreement that prevents the Indians from doing that, but I'm guessing that they don't. So there is always the possibility that the Indians will try to reverse engineer the Gripen and build their own version of it. If that happens, it will be a challenge for Saab to maintain their position as a provider of cutting-edge military technology, and it will also be a blow to their pride and prestige. That's all for today, guys. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.